Welcome to the University of Warwick and the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust birthday video cast. This year we're celebrating Actors Shakespeare. That is a book that several of us have been involved with called The Routledge Companion to Actors Shakespeare. The book has invited us to write as closely as possible about how certain actors make Shakespeare live in performance. And the actors we've covered are Simon Russell Beale, Harriet Walter, Rory Kinnear, and Judy Dench. And we're in the reading room of the Shakespeare Centre, which is open through the year to anyone who's interested uh, in Shakespeare of all ages. And we curate the archive of the Royal Shakespeare Company. And some of that archive is before us. It includes thousands of photographs of actors in performance. So first off for this research conversation, I'm joined by Carol Rutter, who's been working on Simon Russell Beale. Carol, my first question is, when you were asked to contribute an essay for actor Shakespeare, why Simon Russell Beale? Well, it's, it's fascinating. When you're writing about performance, I think that one of the great challenges is to um, remember that thing that so captivated you about a performance that may have been 20 years ago. And for me, Simon Russell Beale was certainly one of those actors I remember seeing in his very first performance at the RSC when he was about 12 years old and playing the young shepherd in Terry Hans' Winter's Tale. Uh, and I remember the magic moment when the young shepherd is told to open the box that has come with the foundling baby. Uh, and he was facing the audience. He opened up this box. It shone gold into his face. <laughs> his eyes exploded. And he had the wonderful line, you're a made old man. If the sins of your youth are forgiven you, you're well to live. And I just, I simply remember being riveted by this young man's performance, what he could do with his body, what he could do with his eyes, and what he could do shaping a line of Shakespeare so that on the one hand, it was hilarious, but at the other hand, it was so poignant, it was heartbreaking. And those two things, those two, those two um, sets, if you will, of parallels, the idea of the body and the line, the body and the speech, and what those are doing in an actor, but also the combination of the vulnerable, the susceptible, the tragic, and the massively comedic, and the risk that an actor takes in combining those are some of the things that, that have persisted in Simon's uh, career, uh, making, well, he's now played all the biggies. Uh, he's played Hamlet, he's played uh, Macbeth, he's going on this next year to play King Lear, he's played uh, Leontes in the Winter's Tale, and going back, the, the uh, uh, performances that we see here on the table at the RSC, from uh, 1986 through to 1994, show him playing Thersites, Ariel in The Tempest, the Toad King Richard III, mm -hmm. uh, and of course back here into uh, the, the, uh, the Winter's Tale. All of these are, it seems to me, documents of an actor taking risks that continue to exemplify. Here's his Thersites. Um, and this Thersites was a kind of a, fig, a, a kind of physical palimpsest of all kinds of subversive ideas. So he's wearing this flasher's Mac and a kind of World War I bomber aces leather pilot's cap. It's a wonderful image in part because it gives you a sense of what he sounded like. Absolutely, because that's the other thing. It's not just a register of what he looked like, but over and over and over again in these images, you're seeing the hand held, mm -hmm. the lips puckering, the face twisted just as he's beginning to utter uh, some line like, I'd rather be a tick on a sheep, but to be Menelaus. So here is an actor, I think, who works in a, in a danger zone, and I find that hugely exciting. It was a fascinating brief we were given for this volume, yes. and I'm, I know we've all gone about it differently, and I think that will be one of the pleasures of the volume. What were the main challenges for you in writing this piece? <laughs> How did you do it? Well, like, 
like the problem that we fa always try to face with capturing performance and turning it into words. How do you account for what the actor does and how do you account for how he works across a line? So I looked very carefully at one set of speeches mm -hmm. uh, in Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the scene that starts uh, with uh, Brutus um, in the garden alone saying it must be by his death. Uh, and then the conspirators come in uh, and Cassius, uh, Simon's part, uh, has the business of, of, of uh, trying really to persuade Brutus mm -hmm. into uh, this conspiracy. Um, and it was a fascinating, just w watching how he worked through that speech, the way he turned words, the way he lifted a, a word out of the grain of the um, iambic pentameter line, where he might put a pause or a half pause mm. uh, and so on. Um, the way he was so aware of the rhetorical structure mm. of this persuasion um, that was both aggressive and self-denying, reflective at the same time, that was, you realized, uh, partway through, was, was, was not just a persuasion, it was actually a seduction mm -hmm. a, a, a speech. Uh, so he gets to the end and uh, he has persuaded uh, Brutus for another appointment. Uh, Brutus goes off and then it was, as, it was as though just a sheet of ice had come down over the face, blanking out Cassius, who became self-loathing in his disgust mm -hmm. at what he had been able to achieve uh, and how honorable people should not ever um, ha have any dealings with the likes of people like me, mm -hmm. Cassius, because we will corrupt you. And that's a, that ability, which as I thought, also think is, is um, in, in images of his oh, Richard, you know, picture, his Richard it? III, um, uh, or the Iago that he played at the National Theatre, directed by Sam Mendes, uh, his, abil his ability to move from a, from a highly expressive to this clamped down mm. Mm. void, vacancy, as though he turned into a human black hole, mm. is absolutely thrilling, particularly because it's always conducted across the energy of the line. I, I wrote about Harriet Walter, as you know, and one of the things that I remember being especially interested in is the development of her ability, as it were, mm -hmm. through her career mm -hmm. and how her Cleopatra in 2006 is different, of course, from her Helen in All's Well yeah. in 1981. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what kinds of things do you say about Simon from that point well, of view? Well, one of the things that I think is there from the beginning is how this, how this young actor sees his body. Mm -hmm. His body is not a romantic mm -hmm. body. Um, in this original picture, he's looking a little bit like a woolly bully, like, like, a, like a sheep himself. Um, and I think from his own sense of who he is as an actor, he plays with uh, both being in body, deeply in body, but also having a sense of contempt and loathing for the body. Mm. Now, that's an idea that has developed across his Thersites, indeed mm. is there in the Ariel, that very taciturn, closed mm. down um, Ariel, and then is ex exploited to monumental effect with Richard III, that self-serving, self, -serving, self uh, uh, imploding almost, Richard, who's sitting there with his little bobbing balloon next to the actor who is, uh, who's playing his child uh, nephew. Um, that's one of the things. The way he's ab he has, is able to kind of exploit that sense of his aging and changing body and to become, I think, much more... He's a wonderfully tactile audience and has been from the beginning, but that tactility, um, I think, has changed. For a good example, um, in The Winter's Tale at the National... Um, uh, sorry, at the, um, for the Bridge Project last year, um, he was, a, he was a dad, he, was mm -hmm. a, he had a little boy, he tucked up that little boy in bed and sang a nursery song to him, hummed it under his breath. So when Paulina brought in the bastard baby and shoved the baby into his arms, his first instinct was to take the baby and to start, you know, mm -hmm. to start rocking it, to start patting it, to start actually humming to it before, of course, he went rigid. Mm -hmm. Now, that kind of sense of being um, competent in your body, uh, and uh, is, is, is one of the development uh, things. But also, I just think the development of the voice. He has, for me, absolutely the best voice 
on the on the on the English stage. So he's a and fine singer. As oh, well. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But he's a, he has a voice that comes out of that singing mm. practice that can move up octaves and then suddenly just plummet, mm. just suddenly drop. I remember being struck about Harriet that she plays the flute. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. for her, the sound of music is an important feature in the Shakespearean verse line. And yeah. she will um, say very much that, you know, one of the things that um, helps her is, is the music of the line, almost beyond its meaning in some cases. Yes, and, and he, uh, 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 Simon's um, uh, aware as a singer, mm. um, technically, just how much voice how much breath Shakespeare requires to be spoken. Again, talking about Leontes, one of the things that he was, he was aware of in the fifth act of that play is just how much breath the actor needs to have mm. to be able to speak those speeches. Mm. He also, I think, um, is very much aware how the actor um, shaping, shaping the breath and the breathing is going to make, uh, make sense uh, make meaning out of the line. So he gave me the example of um, of Macbeth's first soliloquy: "If it were done, when tis done; if it were if it were done, when tis done; twere well, it were done quickly." And then just uh, 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 experimenting with where you put the stress: if it were done, mm -hmm. if it were done, if it were done, and moving the stresses around and thinking about where the breathing is 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 going absolutely changes the meaning of the line. Mm. Uh, so for him, Leontes' line, too hot, too hot. Most actors do it too hot, too hot when and Leontes has his first traumatic vision of Hermione perhaps committing adultery in front of his very own eyes. Um, uh, Simon's was too hot, too hot. Mm. Um, and in a way suggesting that there was a, a, an appropriate amount of heat that could be elicited amongst friends, but that was going beyond it. Mm. So. It, Finding those kind of ways of using the breath that he hears, I think, like Harriet, mm -hmm. um, uh, acoustically because of his music training, I think is, is profoundly important to him as an actor. She recalls with great fondness working with Peggy Ashcroft oh. on All's Well and learning from um, Peggy Ashcroft what to do if you dried and if you suddenly couldn't remember the next line. Mm -hmm. And she used to see Peggy almost imperceptibly freeze, be completely unflappable, and speak the next <laughs> line. And she said, what's the, what's the secret? And uh, Dame Peggy uh, said to her, well, you just hold in your head the sound of the music of the line, mm -hmm. and don't panic, and it will come back to you, and you'll be right. Which is an interesting thought. I mean, that's born from huge experience, well, but the trust I, in that sense of the absolutely. musicality. One of the things that Simon talks about is how bad he is with props, you know, and how our props make him nervous. Mm. And yet everything that he does with props, I, mean, I was thinking about, you know, how, you, not, not just as an actor, how you have to remember the lines and get on stage in the costume, but then you have to start manipulating these things around you and keeping control of mm. them. Um, and you know, so for, for for him over here with Thersites, he had this he had this little jester's bauble that he took with him, um, or with uh, with uh, 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 Richard the Third, he had this little kind of Charlie Chaplin esque bending cane. cane. Yes. Uh, he didn't carry a weapon, no. but uh, when Buckingham's head. Uh, was delivered to him, all wrapped up in this beautiful uh, uh, brown, brown paper, paper parcel. parcel. He suddenly took his kit, whipped out his kit, and just put it right through the center of the, And everybody in the theater went, <laughs> oh, because they just heard the cane going through um, the head. So um, uh, Peggy Ashcroft's kind of, kind of pause, wait for the line mm. to come back. I think probably Simon would say that his area of terror is manipulating these things mm. that uh, he has to, uh, to control um, uh, on, in performance. We're surrounded by the, the tip of the iceberg because, yeah. I mean, to research a production at the Shakespeare Centre, you can consult the original prompt books annotated with lighting cues, yes. music cues, um, stage management cues and, and, and movements on stage. There are the reviews, there are the video archive uh, recordings of which you know are on of uneven um, quality, but well, they're, they're there is a quality, document. Yeah. They're archive quality. Yeah. You can get a sense of what it was like. I mean, the earliest one actually is 
um, Trevor Nunn's All's Well at Ends Well, in which Harriet plays Helen. And I was bowled over mm. watching it to write the piece uh, because it could have been filmed three weeks ago. Yes, uh -huh. It was very good quality and it yeah. goes back to 1981. And in fact, the, the camera didn't seem too far from the stage. And the, you could see, you could see what she was doing and what she said. Yeah, it's right. a particularly good record if you have all of the other materials Absolutely. to support it. Yeah. And you have the best resource of this place, which are the human resources, somebody to go and ask you to, you know, to help you. Bring uh, in the right direction. Yeah, to decipher yeah. what's going on in a particular yes. bit of film. Because yes. that's one of the great, the great uh, advantages of, of a library mm. like this, an archive like this, is that there are people around mm. informing uh, whatever I can do by their own memories and, and, and recollections and help. Mm -hmm. In this day and age, though, yeah. of going to the cinema and seeing a live broadcast, from the National Theatre, from the Metropolitan Opera in New York. And we're taken closer to the action, close-ups on stage, multi-cameras, broadcasting the performance. What does that do to our understanding of live performance? What does that do to theatre history, would you say? I mean, in some well, ways it's early days, we won't know, but it's a very different experience from watching an archive video and from looking at a uh, a, a whole crop of, of photographs in a prompt book because you feel you're actually watching the show. Well, do you? Um, <laughs> I have the experience of watching or seeing um, uh, uh, Jacoby's King Lear oh, yes, at the Donmar, yeah. and mm. then I also saw the live broadcast. And what fascinated me about the broadcast, we did it, they did it twice, uh, they showed it twice um, at Warwick. Uh, and uh, students told me that they, in the first seeing, the first viewing, watching that live, um, the, um, the technology had broken down. So they had to stop the performance, mm. set everything back up again, start it again. Uh, and so Paul Jessen, who was playing Gloucester, had to start over on the Dover, the Dover, Cliffs, the Dover Cliffs scene yeah. and jump off Dover Cliffs again or not. Um, <laughs> So I was, I was really geared up for that, um, seeing how, how this live recording would capture a real moment of theatre history. And I was terribly disappointed when I got to the, to the live broadcast to see that they'd edited it out. Oh, really? So they had gone seamlessly through. Now, to my mind, that is um, a devaluing mm -hmm. and a, an erasing of a really important bit of theatre history. So because they manipulated, exactly, they treated it, They had treated yeah. it as though it hadn't happened. Okay? Mm. That was one thing. But also, of course, having seen it in the theatre and seeing it on film, I was constantly aware that I wasn't getting the whole picture. Mm. That I was going, my viewing, my spectator, leadership always had to go where the camera was going. Mm -hmm. Now the archive videos are set up so that they more or less get the whole stage. They're mm -hmm. just taking a, a, a continuous picture of what's going on on stage. The live relay is, is doing much more like what film does in editing, shooting, cutting in, doing close up and so on. So you're constantly aware that there's something happening just off camera mm. that I said, no, you need to be looking over there as well. It's important for us to have that reaction. Um, so for, to my mind, although, although the, live, uh, the, the, the live broadcasts um, are a huge resource, you know, they're gonna take Shakespeare way beyond anybody who can get to London uh, to, see, uh, to see a show. But they're not either going to replace the real thing, mm. which is the, you know, having, having the smell of the theatre mm. in your nostrils there in the flesh with the other people mm. and knowing what the audience is doing. Because again, they don't capture that um, in the film. Uh, and it isn't also going to replace this still archive that stops me for a moment and allows me mm. to go in close, to remember in detail, to stop, as mm. it were, stop the performance for me to be, at, like, it's, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, stopping the line of poetry for me just to be able to savor that one image, to think about that one metaphor, to work on that one idea that then helps me release the rest of the sonnet or the mm -hmm. rest of the speech or indeed the rest of the play. So that's what these do. They very artificially stop the performance and give me time to go in deep and to think in a, in a, very, in a very deep structured sort of way. Um, and of course they also just trigger memory. Mm -hmm. They trigger memory. I, can st I mean, I can still see that on stage. I can see the next thing that's going to happen 
but this is my aid, literally my aid mm -hmm. memoir that, that puts me back into that production and nothing is ever going to, to replace that. Carol, this is fascinating. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward uh, later on to speaking uh, with Stanley Wells and Paul Prescott about Judy Dench and, and Rory Kinnear. And once again, happy birthday, Bill. Happy birthday. <laughs> what a great way to celebrate, yeah. to think about the performances we've seen and the actors we've written about doing Shakespeare. Thank you.